uh, with your finances. All right, let me call you to worship. Um, we're going to sing our first song of praise is Consider Christ. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews, which is probably Luke, um, and he, he writes and he says in, he's, he's reminded them to, to press on. That the Christian faith is one where you press on you despite difficulties and trials. And in chapter 12, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Well, let's um, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in your Son, that you have called us in your Gospel, that your Son, our Lord Jesus, uh, went to Golgotha, the one who was without sin, And he became sin for us so that that sin that that clings so closely to us would not condemn us, but rather Christ would die for us and be raised for us so there would be no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so as we gather this morning, uh, strengthen our faith that we might freely confess our sin to you who sees us, who knows us, who strengthens us and who promises to forgive us if we were to confess our sins and we would do it now and that you would, our Heavenly Father, through the blood of our Lord Jesus, take our sin as far as east is from west from us. I take away our harsh words, uh, uh, our indifference to others and to suffering and to the needs of those around us. Uh, uh, take away, our Heavenly Father, our thoughts that, dishonor you and grant to us that we might consider Christ and that we might set our thoughts upon his kingdom and his way and in doing so that you would build us up and encourage us through this service. And so may that joy of your salvation permeate all that we do for we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's stand and we'll sing together our first song of praise, Consider Christ.
Children, can we have you all up the front, please? What? Where'd you all come from? Absolutely. All right, as you find a seat, can you tell me if you all enjoyed school holidays? It's been pretty good. Cool. Uh, my name's Mr. McGilvery, and I am the parent of Elsa. Henry, Ethan, and Lorena. Do you all know them? Cool. So you had fun school holidays? Yeah. Was it always fun, or did you sometimes have some sad times as well? Did you get any disappointments? Or? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what happens sometimes when we think we're going to have fun. And we get all excited, and then... Maybe we think too much about ourselves, what we want to do, and then get disappointed. That's okay. What we're going to do this morning is look at our catechism, and we've been learning about Adam and Eve. So let's have a look. Can you tell me who our first parents were? Yeah. Pretty easy, isn't it? Um, what else have we got? What did God give Adam and Eve beside bodies? Souls that can never die. Excellent. You know this pretty good. Do you have a soul as well as a body? Yeah, we do. And what? Yeah, so what's the full answer? Yes, I have a soul that can never... Exactly. How do we know that we have a soul? Very good. Okay. And today's question, in what condition did God make Adam and Eve? Holy and happy. That's great. Um... I'm going to get two helpers. I'm not a very good actor, but I'm going to, I want two actors, a boy and a girl. I reckon Gus, and you can come up to you, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to act out Adam and Eve over here. So I want you to be <laughs> not looking like that, because what it says here is God made Adam and Eve holy and happy. That was their condition, okay? So you stand next to each other and look really happy. <laughs> all right? And I'm going to represent God, all right? So we need something, actually. Maybe you hold this Bible. Can you hold this Bible for me? All right. And you stand together. We'll go for a little walk. So God made Adam and Eve very happy, and they're in the garden, and there is nothing wrong. Hey, Gus, you need to be a bit more attentive. <laughs> Can you have a happy face? Yeah. Now, what happened is it's a bit like in the school holidays. We thought we could get up and do whatever we wanted and just have fun, not worry about anyone else sometimes. And we thought we wanted more than what we'd been given. <laughs> so what happened was a bit like what happened in the back of my car yesterday. There was a massive fight over a drink bottle, and somebody ended up nearly losing a tooth. It was pretty bad. It was a bit like a Collingwood fan club. <laughs> anyway, but, so can you snatch that Bible off, Eve, and make an angry face? All right, and turn your back on each other. Uh-oh, that's not good. Now, I'm representing God, and I was with you, very close, but now that you're so angry and sinful and unholy, do you know what holy means? Without sin. Now, your God is further away from you than he was, and you are not happy or holy anymore. So I think this means that to be happy, we have to be holy. Um, how do you think we can fix it? Anybody got any idea? 
where we need to seek forgiveness. And we need to get down on our knees. Can you get down on your knees? And you need to pray to Jesus, put your hands together. And you need to ask for forgiveness. And Jesus can restore you and make you happy again. So can we get up now and look happy? That's all right. And then God is close to you again, and you can be happy and forgiven. Is that good? Well, that's what we all have to do today because it's, well, it's communion day, so it's particularly we can think about our sins and how they've separated us from God. You can go and sit down now. Thanks for the Bible. I'm glad that you wanted to snatch the Bible. It's good. Um, so I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to do the kids' song, okay? Can you just remember... What condition did God make Adam and Eve? Unhappy. All right. Well, don't ever think you can be happy without being holy, okay? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we pray for all these children here today. We thank you for bringing us to the service, and we thank you, Lord, that you make us um, holy and happy, and we pray that we would trust in you when things go wrong. And we ask for your forgiveness. We pray for joy in our hearts that we would believe in you, Father. Thank you um, for the service this morning and for the children's song. And we pray your blessing upon the children. In Jesus' name, amen. Go back to your seats now. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The rivers are His, the mountains are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The rivers are His, the mountains are His, the stars are His and He work too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Okay, we're going to open God's Word now and look at Proverbs chapter 4. It's page 529 on the Church Bible. Um, you listen along to children because the Proverbs are good to listen to. It teaches you about the paths that you will find wisdom on. Wisdom uh, in chapter 4 of Proverbs, reading 1 to 19. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, 
you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction, do not let go, guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it, do not go on it. Turn away from it, and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have someone made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Thanks, Vaughan. We're going to continue reading uh, through the text. Uh, We're going to challenge, we're going to be looking at the whole of that chapter, Proverbs 4. So I'm just going to continue that reading from verse 20. This is the word of God. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your side. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk from far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then... All your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Amen. And may the Lord give us understanding of his word. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. We know it is a, a double-edged sword. We thank you that it functions uh, like a hammer that can sh- shatter rocks and so our heavenly father we we would pray that it would uh, work in our own lives uh, your will for us that our minds might be uh, renewed and our hearts uh, recalibrated so that our loves are rightly ordered and that we might set our hearts and our minds and our feet to that path of christ and his kingdom and for this to happen, we, we need your spirit to work powerfully in us and through your word for the glory of Jesus and for the building up of his church. To this end, we commend ourselves to you for your kindness and your grace to us. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you, you probably know this, but, but just in case you don't, uh, apart from the apart from the Jordan, which which flows from sort of like the Sea of Galilee, which is in the north all the way down through the middle of Israel, down to the the Dead Sea in the south, there are no running rivers uh, through Israel that run all year round. So that that makes the collection of water paramount to anyone's life. It's why in the Old Testament, you're all seeing the patriarchs digging wells, deep wells. Because without that water, you can't feed your pasture, can't water your crops, can't drink yourself. And so wells are essential to life. You might remember uh, there's that story in uh, 2 Kings uh, 20, when uh, the king of Assyria, uh, Sennacherib, is about to lay siege to Jerusalem. And so as Hezekiah hears about that, the first thing he does is he says to his men, we need to make sure we can secure the water supplies. And so what he does, there's a a spring, the Gion Spring, which is just outside of Jerusalem to the east side. And what he does is he digs a tunnel underground. In fact, that tunnel is about 533 metres, still there today. And he digs this tunnel underground from the spring of Gion, and he brings it underneath the walls in this zigzag fashion. Who knows why that particular route, but he does. And then it it waters inside of the boundaries 
of the walls of Jerusalem, what's called as the Pool of Siloam. And so as, as Assyrians besieged them, Hezekiah knew that they had water and that they were safe. Without the water, without that water, they would perish. Without a spring, there can be no life. And so what Hezekiah does in, in Two Kings, and it's repeated later in Chronicles, is that he makes sure that he guards that well. He puts men on that well to guard it and to guard the tunnel from the enemy. And in a sense, that's what Proverbs 4 is about this morning. Proverbs 4 warns us, it in fact directs us, it entreats us, it says, guard your hearts with all vigilance. Now, just to orientate you, because it's a big chapter we're going to do together, I just want you to see it actually fits together really simply. So verses 1 through to 13 is the description of the father's path. This is Solomon telling his son, this is the path you walk, son. And then what you get in verses 14 to 19 is an alternative path, which is the path of his friends, the friend's path. And then verse 20, you get then this uh, redirection of the sun to focus on the right path. Verses 23 to 27. So very simple breakup of the text. And here's the next thing I want you to understand as you read through Proverbs 4. Always note repetitions of word. Whenever you get a repetition, it's normally for importance. It's normally so that you it grasps your attention. And so you notice how in verse 11, 14, 18, 26, paths, 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 paths. It's all about paths. Remember what we said originally, how the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, he uses this metaphor of path because that's how everybody got around in Jerusalem. They got around by paths. And if you took the wrong path, at best you're delayed, at worst you might die. And so everyone gets this metaphor of life, a path. And so he, he, he has life pictured as, as, as choosing a path to walk. And he's encouraging the path of wisdom because that's the path that leads to insight. That's the path that leads to salvation, righteousness, blessing, life. And he's warning against the other path, which is a conglomeration of every other path in the world, but every other broad path that he calls simply the path of the wicked. And he says that path always leads to death. And everybody is on one of those two paths. Everybody. That's how he pitches life. Prime ministers, premiers, Actors, artists, engineers, electricians, wives, women, brothers, blokes, every single person is on one of those two paths. The path of wisdom, path of wife, or the path of folly that leads to death. I just want you to make a mental note about the importance of the path because you are on one of those two paths. And as we read through the text, you're supposed to work out what path you're on. And if you're on that wrong path, then you better by God's grace repent and get back on that other path. And that's the invitation of the text. It's an invitation to the path of wisdom, the path of Christ, and the path of salvation. Here's the other thing you notice in the text. The, the, what, what, verses 1 to 13 is the father's instruction to the son. Notice how it starts, verse 1. Be attentive. Be attentive. Why would you be attentive? That you might get insight. And, and of course, the opposite is true. If you are inattentive, if you don't pay attention, if you are distracted, then you won't get insight. And again, notice the importance of that, that, that word, attentive, because when he... Re when he returns in verse 22, focusing on the right path, how does he start it? Same word again. Be attentive to your path. And that's how this section starts. Hear, 
O sons of father's instructions, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Be attentive to the word of God. That's what he's saying. Well, you're right here now. You've got the word of God open before you. He's encouraging you. Here, O North Geelong, pay attention to the words of Solomon, which in fact are the very words of God. And if you are attentive, you will get insight. He says, be attentive to my words because that's how you get insight. People who don't have insight into living, people who live dull, who live unwise lives, who make and repeat dumb mistakes are people without insight. They're people who don't stop and reflect. They're people with no insight into life, into themselves, into sin, into righteousness. No insight into the gospel. They do not pay attention. Those who pay attention, he says, to Christ, they get insight. Verses 2 to 4, he explains that's what his father, as Solomon's saying, that's what my father David did with me. He says, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. That's what his father told him. In fact, that's what all good fathers tell their kids. That's what all Christian fathers should be telling their kids. They should be urging them, be attentive to the gospel. How sad and tragic we can have our kids and our teenagers and they're here in a church and they've got the gospel served up on a platter and they pay no attention. And they get no insight. And they don't consider Christ. And he says, be attentive to the word of God. John 3, uh, 3.16 says, do you know how God loved the world? And he gives the answer, he gave his only son. And here is Solomon saying, do you know how fathers love their kids? They give them the word of God. And they urge them, maybe even demand them, be attentive. Because it's in being attentive to the gospel, according to verse 5, that you get wisdom and you get insight. And you see, if you get wisdom, if you, if you get fear of the Lord, if you get the Christ, then you will get insight. You see, remember what we said, knowledge is the gaining of facts or truths about God and his created order. Uh, wisdom is the wise application of that knowledge to various, whatever the situations may be in life. But what insight is, is the ability to see things as they really are. It's sort of like seeing the inner nature of reality. See, the, what the gospel does, what wisdom does, is it gives you insight so that you actually are able to understand people. In fact, you're able to understand yourself. You have to understand your heart and what motivates you. It gives you eyes to see both people and circumstances, indeed, even the times and events. Remember the, the men of Issachar who are commended in Scripture. It says that those men had understanding or insight of their times to know what Israel ought to do. That's true of Christians. If you've got Christ and you've got the gospel and you grow in wisdom, you get insight, then you will know how to live well. You will know how to live in these times. And so Solomon's urging his son in verse 5, 6, don't forget, don't, don't turn away, don't forsake her. He says, love her, love wisdom. Love Christ. Love the gospel. And he says, and if you do, she will guard you. If you love wisdom, wisdom will guard your heart. That's why verse 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. That's how I know you're wise. That's how you know you're wise, that you pursue wisdom. You get it. He says, and whatever you get, Get insight. 
because that's how you're going to live well and love well and serve well and lead well and spend well and choose well and prioritize your life well. It's how you'll make friends well and, and make decisions well. It's even how you're going to die well. And see, if that is true, and it is, verses 8 to 9 says, then you ought to prize her. Remember, wisdom is personified as, is personified as a woman, but in fact, the Scriptures tell us it points us to Christ. And we're to love her, prize her highly. Verses 8 and 9 says, and she will exalt you. She will honor you. It just if you embrace her, and she will place on your ha- a head a, a graceful garland, she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. There is a winsomeness. There is a beauty. There is an attractiveness about those who walk in wisdom and with insight. And so in verses 10 to 13, he reminds them, he says, so hear my words. Uh, keep my instructions. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. Just, she's your life. And she will, according to verse 11, lead you in paths of uprightness so you do not stumble. We well, put that in New Testament terms, that if you follow Christ, that you will love him and you will obey him and you will walk in love towards God and towards neighbor. And you will not stumble. And see, what he then does is he says, here's this path. This is, this is what David said. And this is what Solomon's saying. And he's telling this to his sons. Listen. Love wisdom, prize her, pursue her, get her, because getting her, you get life and you get insight. And then he juxtaposes it against the path of what he knows, the, the, the friends of his sons, his culture, his cohort. And he says that there's another path that most of your friends will be walking. And he says, be careful about that path. He says, do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. You know what? Which is so simple, isn't it? I mean, like, here we go. We have a key for success. You don't want your life to, to, go, to become difficult. You don't want life to be hard. Well, it's easy. Here's the thing. Don't go on the path of wickedness. Well, it's simple. Don't do sin. That's what he says. Avoid sin. Turn away from it. Pass on from it. That's what he's telling us. And, and there's a simplicity about that because we actually know it's much harder than that, isn't it? Because sin is attractive. The path is broad. And there's fellow travelers. I mean, probably a horde of Brisbane supporters on that path, might I imagine. All the toothless ones are on the other one. And so there's this other path, and he's actually telling you, and this is part of wisdom that you get inside, it's a path that you actually have to actively avoid. You have to actively avoid it. You've got to turn away from it. Apparently you're not supposed to enter into it. It's, it's a broad path, and it's a busy path. And it's popular and many who are traveling will tell you it's exciting fulfilling even verses 16 to 17 for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong they are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence and he's picturing he's speaking of the eagerness to follow the heart you know, he says, take that, that, that sort of view of life that, 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 that life's a, a smorgasbord. It's a feast, and you've just got to enjoy yourself. He's got to feast. Enjoy everything that's on offer and to live without boundaries or restrictions. And, and apparently the text says, this path has its evangelists. And, and they're urging you, come and join us. This is the good path. This is the path of liberation. This is the path of freedom. This is the path of satisfaction and pleasure. 
And it says they cannot sleep. They can't sleep unless they've gained some fellow travelers. They're evangelical about drawing you onto the path that they're on. And, and, and you don't have to think hard about the metaphor that he's using. And, and whether you apply it to individuals or groups at school or groups of friends at work, or even if it's governments, and whether the urges for drunkenness or immorality or violence or gain, whether the attraction is drugs or sex or, or porn, it doesn't really matter in one sense. But these evangelists are urging you on this path because apparently that's the path of freedom and pleasure. And so you've got digital barons and, and democratic rulers and, and a mirror in other nations of despots and they're all urging their people, including themselves, to be on that path. And you've got all these media moguls and elected masters, cultural warriors, and they, they cannot sleep and they will not sleep until others will join them. And so they legalize and normalize and celebrate. It's like, if I if think about that, like, I've got to be honest, I haven't been to a nightclub in a little while. Um, but just, I can sort of vaguely remember what a nightclub was like. What, what strikes my mind first is it's always dark, isn't it, when you go into a nightclub? It's always dark. Lighting is always kept to a bare minimum. Why? Because it conceals. You, you go into a dark place, it sort of gives you this sense of anonymity. And it makes you less self-conscious. And you're sort of like as if you were both in reality, but also perhaps metaphorically, that you are concealed in the darkness or by the darkness. And, and everyone in there is relaxed and they're drinking and they're hooking up. And because everyone else is doing that, and because that behavior is normative at a nightclub, it is normative to drink to you vomit. It is normative to lean into people and to grope people and to proposition people. That makes it easy for you to do it. That's why a bloke will approach a woman at a nightclub in a way that he would never dare at a coffee shop. Because the darkness and the night conceals and encourages Listen, here's, here's Solomon, he's saying to his sons, I know the pull of culture. I know how the culture speaks to you. I know what it promises. I, I know what path your friends are on. And it beckons you, and it calls you, and it draws you from, from, from TV shows to streaming media to, to, to social media to legislators Even though verse 19 says that the way of the wicked is like a deep darkness. And they do not know over what they stumble. See what he's saying there? Even though this path they walk on is a deep darkness, they don't understand it. They don't see the darkness. They don't know what they stumble over. Because actually you would need wisdom and insight to understand that that path is darkness. And you see, if you don't have Christ and you don't get insight, then of course the broad path doesn't look destructive. Of course the broad path doesn't look like it's leading to hell. It's a path that glitters and glows. It promises and it preaches. And, and, it, and it calls you and it, and it seduces you. But ultimately... If you've got insight, you know that it's a path, though it be winding, that always leads to Hades. Unlike in verse 18, the path of the righteous, he says, which is like a light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Well, isn't that a beautiful picture of following Christ? It's like the morning dawn and the line shines, and as you walk with Christ for your life, that light gets brighter and brighter until the day the Lord returns or calls you home into his glory. 
the longer that you embrace Christ and wisdom, you get insight. And so then having, here's the father's path. Here's the temptation, your friend's path. Then what you get in verses 23 to 27 is he, he redirects your focus to the right path. And so again, you get that, that, um, those words in the beginning of those verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. So if you are to end up on the right path, you need to be attentive to the word of God. And being attentive to the word of God, you get wisdom, you get insight, and you have this attentive heart. And he says, he's picturing it as the way of life, the way of human flourishing, the way of healing from all of your folly and your sin. Because that's what he does. He said, it brings you life and it gives you healing. The way that the gospel actually heals you. you. You get wiser and you get more insight. You learn how to repent. You become more humble. You understand the deceptiveness of your own heart. You learn how to reflect on your motives. You get insight and therefore it brings healing. So you don't make the same dumb mistakes time and time and time again. Because that's what gospel grace does. It transforms. That's what Christ does. It brings the power of the Spirit within our lives so we get insight. And by grace, we see transformation. And therefore, that's why he says, be attentive. Be attentive. And then you get to verse 23, and that is the key. That's the key verse of the whole chapter. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. And the, the Hebrew word keep means to watch or guard. So the path of wisdom, this is what it says. Guard your heart. Guard it. Whereas the path of folly says, follow it. Follow your heart. That's your choices. That's your two paths. Wisdom says, guard your heart. Folly says, follow your heart. You just let that sit there. Because how many young people have walked that path of folly and they followed their heart? And it led them into sin. Here is wisdom speaking to us, saying, no, you, you know, you don't follow your heart. Your heart, above all things, is deceitful. You need to actually guard your heart. And that's what the gospel does. It gives you insight. You get insight into your own heart. Just as Hezekiah guarded the spring from the enemy. So too, Proverbs 4 is warning us. In fact, actually directing us that you need to guard your heart. And notice what he says, with all vigilance. You picture a dog with his bone. We've got two dogs when you've got one dog, dogs with bones are lazy. Uh, very rarely do the children try to steal the dog's bone. Very rarely, unless you don't feed them. But, but uh, when you have two dogs, those dogs guard their bones. Just picture a Presbyterian with money. It's not men. This is, when he talks about guarding with all vigilance, he's not, he's not talking about, you know, when you... When, um, you're watching footy and your wife says, I'm going, I'm going shopping, look after the kids. It's not that type of guarding where you never really sort of concentrate on them at all. The sort of guarding with vigilance here is the sort of when your mother-in-law says she's come for a little while. Oh, little while? Well, we'll watch the clock, eh? That sort of guarding, that sort of vigilance. And why? Why would you guard your heart with all vigilance? Because it's the wellspring of life. He's saying that all your thoughts, your choices, your feelings, they flow from your heart. You've got to guard it. We often, I think, as Presbyterians, because we're fairly cerebral, and we like to know our theology, and all those things are good, but sometimes I think we fool ourselves that we are fundamentally shaped by what we believed. And while that is partly true, it is also true that you are shaped by what you love. 
Your heart is just as powerful as your mind. And so, if you were to be wise this morning, you should be getting insight. And see, properly understood human virtues, and we've been speaking a lot about human virtues, like that, that we should add our virtues to our faith. The whole calling of following Christ is adding virtues to faith. But if you understand it properly, then human virtues are nothing more than forms of love. That's what they are. A human virtue is just a form of love. You take courage. Courage is loving your neighbor's well-being more than you love your own safety. And we call you courageous because you ran into danger. You loved your neighbor more than your own safety. Or if you think it's about honesty, honesty is actually loving your neighbor's interest more than your own financial gain, even if in being honest it disadvantaged you. You should think about that the next time you put something dodgy on Marketplace. Jesus said, you can essentially boil down the whole law of God to two commands, to love God vertical and to love neighbor horizontal. Because what it actually comes down to is rightly ordered loves, rightly ordered desires, and that's why wisdom says, guard your heart, and you do it with all Vigilance, if you want to flourish, if you want to live well, if you want to live wise. He, he said, if you want careers and husbands and wives and girlfriends, because this is what it is, that's what our heart gets tangled up with, we pursue careers. And if we're young and we're not married, we pursue a partner. And so boyfriends and girlfriends and potential spouses, we, we concern ourselves in pursuing careers and success. We want money and entertainment. We, 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 we want a life that is, I don't know, prestigious, that is esteemed, that is profitable. We, we want to perform well. We, we, maybe even be popular. And see, so they, they, they're not all sinful. In fact, most of them are good. But you've got to be very careful in pursuing those things that they don't become disordered loves. So that you want that career more than you want obedience to Jesus. Or you want that bloke more than obedience to the gospel. Or you want pleasure more than you want fidelity. See, the Bible calls this idolatry. It's a sin of idolatry. It's why Calvin said that the heart is actually... It's a little factory that just produces idols. And the moment you smash one, the heart creates another. Whether that's safety, whether that's wealth, whether it's security, whether it's affection, your heart just creates idols. And so here is wisdom telling us you need to guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Oh, how I pray this morning that you get insight into that. And so consequently, verses 25 to 27, he speaks about the focus of our eyes, of focusing on that path of wisdom. He says, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight ahead of you, before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left, Turn your feet away from evil. And essentially what he's saying is, eyes straight ahead, get your thoughts focused on Christ and his kingdom, and, and in your heart, determine or purpose in your heart to stay the course. That's what he means to, to guard your heart. It's about an intentionality of your gaze. What are you gazing at? Wherever your gaze is, that's what you love. And he's asking you to have self-reflection. That is that you stop and consider what your gaze is on and what it is that you love. And then having done that, he's saying that you might purpose or determine in your heart that you would now follow Christ and pursue his kingdom and that path. 
And that's the choice that you have set before you this morning. The path of wisdom that tells you to guard your heart or the path of folly that says just follow your heart. And if you were attentive this morning, then you would already know that wisdom has spoken. And if knowledge is gaining the truth about God and the created order and wisdom is the application of that knowledge to life, then insight is the ability to see things as they really are. And that's what you'd be able to do. You'd be able to see yourself, your own heart, people, circumstances, and you would then navigate them well. And here it talks about the blessings of that. It's not a prosperity gospel. But actually following wisdom has its blessings. Ordering your loves and your desires has its blessings. Because then all of a sudden, your hearts would be directed to God and to neighbor. You would then be spouses who bless your spouses. You would be children who honor your parents. You'd be a witness who's faithful, a boss who's just, a, a friend who's actually loyal, a helper who's present, a giver who's cheerful, an enemy who is kind, an elder who is humble, a worker who's industrious, a stranger who's hospitable, an intellectual who would be teachable, a sinner who repents, a believer who trusts, a disciple who serves, a follower who obeys, a Christian who worships. That would be the fruit and the evidence of a flourishing life in Christ that produces wisdom and therefore you get insight because the path of wisdom is flourishing. Therefore, guard your heart with all vigilance because it is the wellspring of life of which all of your loves flow. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for Christ and we thank you in Christ, in him, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and insight. We thank you that your spirit uh, fills us so that we can see the wisdom of Scripture, the attractiveness of the gospel. We pray even now that, that our hearts have been attentive and that you would have directed them uh, to that, that path of righteousness, which is the path of flourishing, that our lives might increasingly be marked out by wisdom and insight that would shape our relationships and our endeavors like work and play, our service in the church. And so, our gracious God, we would commit ourselves to you. I'll give us wisdom and insight in abundance that our, our lives and our feet might walk in that wisdom, might reflect that wisdom, might have blessings flow from that wisdom. And if there is any amongst us who are on a different path, a path that they thought glittered and glowed, Oh, we pray that you would be gracious to them and, and that your spirit would give them insight that they might see the very end and destination of that path, which is death and judgment and hell. And so we pray that your spirit would direct them to that, that path of life and blessing. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's respond to God's word. We're going to do that uh, by way of singing. Uh, we'll stand and we'll sing for our song of response, every promise of your word.
that sometimes um, when we come to prayer, uh, we uh, don't approach it with the glee perhaps that we do. We wonder that oh, I'll get a bit lost, get a bit boring. But let me just encourage you again. It's a, it's a privilege that we can come before our creator and sustainer and that he actually hears our prayers. Uh, and he delights in us as a congregation actually humbling ourselves before him in a time of prayer. So let's, let's do that. Let's come together in prayer. Father, we thank you that through your Son you have opened up the paths of righteousness and salvation. That indeed, even the very gates of heaven, we have one who has seated on that throne, our great high priest, and he has told us that we can, we can come to him, we can pray in his name, and that he will gladly receive us and hear us. In fact, that he actually delights in us, his people, that our Father loves the church and Jesus, the Christ, loves the church and, and God the Holy Spirit delights in the bride of Christ too. And so, Father, we delight in your salvation and we delight in the privilege of prayer. Lord, you know us. You know us better than we know ourselves. Part of our walk with you is we, we not only become get to know you better, but we get to know ourselves better. We get insight. Well, part of that insight is that we know that you know us. You know our every word, our every deed. You know all of our good. You know the things that we've done seeking good, but perhaps have been misunderstood. You know where we intended good, but perhaps it didn't work out that way. You knew our motives and not just the outcomes. But also, you know our evil. You know where we've done good, but our motives have been wrong. And you know we're under the camouflage of darkness we sought to hide. And you know that about us. And we know that you know that. And so, as Vaughan reminded the children this morning, 
The only way that we can be happy and holy in you is to make use of the means of grace, to pray, to believe the promises in which we stand, that if we were to confess our sin, that you're faithful and just and have promised you'll forgive us and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Do it now. Give us that grace that we might believe these things so that joy might fill our hearts, confidence that we don't have to hide from you because you're a father who loves us and a father who gives us wisdom and insight so that we can flourish in this life. Would you do that now? Would you enable your word to get traction in our hearts that many in this congregation, even this morning, would be purposing in their hearts to get wisdom and to get insight and to set their eyes straight ahead. Their feet might not turn from left or right, but to follow Christ and to pursue his kingdom. Would you bless the weak? Would you strengthen them in their needs? Would you lift up the weary and the discouraged? Would you refocus and grant repentance to the discontent? For those who are content and happy and blessed, would you give them hearts that overflow with thankfulness? For all of us, would you give us virtues that we can add to our faith? Would you help us to rightly order the desires and loves of our hearts that we might pursue you and pursue the good of our neighbor so those virtues might flourish? Would you bless our children and draw them to yourself? Would you guard the feet of our youth so that that glittering, glowing, broad path which calls them, they might resist and they might follow the path of Christ and his kingdom, which is actually the path of blessing and grace and flourishing and joy. Would you be pleased to hear our prayers for our nation in which you have placed us and our city in which we are witness? Would you give wisdom to those who know Christ in the corridors of power at state and federal levels, uh, whether they are in power themselves or whether they guide and advise those in power? Would you direct the feet of our Prime, uh, Prime Minister and our new Premier that they might lead our state with wisdom, not in passive wickedness but righteousness? according to your common grace. We pray for the salvation of all types of people, magistrates and kings and premiers and prime ministers. And we ask for them that, that, that they might all come to see that they serve a king who is over all the kings. For our city, a great city, Geelong, for numerous people, of which the vast majority are on a different path. Oh, have mercy upon our city, Lord. Give boldness to your church. Help us to be faithful with the gospel. Give us zeal in our witness. Give us fidelity in our living. Uh, give us clarity and wisdom in our decision making so that your church in Geelong, in all of its various configurations and denominations, that they might be faithful and that you might cause them to be fruitful in their service and in their witness and in their worship. We pray for individuals specifically and we are rejoicing with the Mallow family. Thank you that Mel's home and, and recovering. We rejoice in uh, a healthy son in John, Patrick, and we don't take these things for granted and so we want to Praise your name. We, we pray for Kevin, that he might bless Mal and that we might be able to support them as a family in very practical ways over the coming weeks and particularly support them in prayer, which is the most practical of all. We want to thank you that we can pray for Jack as he's started his first week of training and at Kapuka and we just commend him to you and uh, pray, our Heavenly Father, that you will give him the strength uh, to persevere and particularly that you might uh, 
fix his eyes upon Christ over this coming 12 months. We ask our Heavenly Father that you would bless those who are looking for homes in Geelong and are looking to relocate over the summertime that you might make provision for them. We pray for the strengthening of our families. We want to thank you for our elders and we pray for our elders, particularly uh, thank you uh, for Richard, and who has been a bit unwell recently, and we're thankful that he's feeling better. We pray for all our other elders, that you will sustain each and every one of them, that you would corporately together help us uh, to be humble and to be wise and to lead and to serve well, and that we might be conscious continually of being faithful to you, our Lord and Saviour. Our Heavenly Father, we're mindful of our responsibility to pray for the GAV as it meets next week. It will make many decisions. Some of them are challenging uh, issues that we are faced with. We pray that, uh, that we will have a unity and a wisdom so that we might make good decisions for the denomination. And even though many of us are dread, uh, four or five days of meetings, day and night, uh, we pray that you'll give us uh, perseverance and see this as a way of service to Christ, even if we consider it a trial. And so, Father, we pray that we might honour you in all of our circumstances. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, there are many little children in this congregation. We've spoken today and heard about how wise father urged their children to be attentive to the gospel. Well, that's what wise mothers do as well. Would you make us as parents wise and gospel focus that we might teach our children to be attentive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we might pray for them and that our hearts being rightly ordered would be filled with virtues that we can model for them. And would you help us to pray not just for our own children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but for all the children in this church and for the generations to the sixth and seventh that might follow, that your covenant mercies might extend to them all. And so with all these prayers and all of the unspoken ones of which you already know, we commit them to you, the one who loves us. And we ask what we've asked in accordance with your will, that you might do it, and that we might wait patiently for your hand to be revealed. And with these things, and of all of our adoration and praise, we also offer up our free will offerings with our lives. And we ask that they might be pleasing to you, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to take the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper. So I'm just going to invite the elders to come forward and we'll eat at the Lord's Supper together. Well, we're all very uh, familiar uh, with the Lord's Supper. Those things that we do uh, regularly, because the scripture tells us to do these things. It is what we call a covenant renewal meal. So when you eat this meal together as God's people, what we're doing is publicly, we're renewing the covenant. Uh, we're renewing our commitment to Christ. Uh, we have eager people, as you can see, uh, who are very eager to renew covenant. Uh, so... If you love Jesus, if you are a Christian this morning, uh, particularly if you are a member in good standing, or maybe you're visiting from another congregation a member in good standing, then this is actually a meal for you. It's a meal for those who love Jesus and who believe the gospel. And when you eat this meal, but it's not just remembrance. I want to say that because we're not just remembering. We do remember, but it's more than that. God promises grace, not magic, not fairy dust, but grace in the same way that he promises. If you read his word, 
grace will come to you. If you eat the Lord's Supper and you meditate upon the gospel, grace will come to you. This is what we call the means of grace. And they're reminders that God has loved you through his son. And therefore, if you're a sinner who loves Jesus, you should come to this table with joy in your heart because it's a reminder of the gospel that blood has been shed for you and a body has been given for you. And as you eat and you drink, it is meant to remind you and assure you of the gospel. But of course, if you're, if you're not a Christian, then the invitation to come and eat and drink also has a warning because Scripture says if you eat and drink this in an unworthy manner, which is uh, in unbelief or in unrepentance or in division, in particular case in Corinth, then actually you eat and drink judgment on yourself. And so the way that you avoid that is a simple means of grace. We pray and we say to God, Thank you for this covenant gospel reminder. Thank you. We have these visible reminders that you have loved us in your son. Forgive my sin and strengthen my faith. And our Heavenly Father will do those things. So I'm going to uh, pray on our behalf. And then we're going to read these words and eat and drink together. Our Father... We thank you that we've had the gospel preached and now we have the gospel shown, visualized. We have John 3.16 right before us. God has loved the world so that he gave his son. And so our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the giving of Jesus for us. We thank you that as we come to this table, we can confess our sin. And we know that we come to this table, we're not worthy. Christ is worthy, but we are worthy and righteous by faith. And it is by faith we come. And so as we do that, would you bless us? As we eat and drink, would your spirit tarry with ours and encourage us and bless us and remind us of these basic gospel truths so that our hearts might be full with gospel joy and confidence and assurance. And if there is any amongst us that have no confidence in Christ, have unconfessed sin, uh, 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 are troubled or divided from others, and we pray that you would grant them no rest until they find it in the Lord Jesus, that your spirit would convict them even now at this hour, that they might come to you in prayer, and as they prepare their hearts and have it rightly ordered, eat and drink of this meal that speaks of the good news of Jesus Christ, that we might publicly renew our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because we ask all this in his precious name. Amen. Well, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
in remembrance of Jesus. In the same manner, after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Till he comes again. A covenant God, you have lavished us with your covenant mercies in your Son. You have blessed us by placing us into your church. You have granted to us these great promises. And you have nourished our soul on the gospel. We thank you that because of Christ we have got wisdom and insight. We would pray this morning that our faith might flourish because of your grace, that the gospel would bear much fruit in our lives, in the reordering of our hearts. We pray there might be a thankfulness that will mark out our lives so we see ourselves as debtors to your mercy. We know that, that you have blessed us and forgiven us and have granted us these great and powerful promises. And so... Our Heavenly Father, would you receive us this morning? Would you bless us as we bring our worship to a conclusion? Would we, as we gather for morning tea, 
Would your gospel grace permeate our conversations and encourage us as we head into this week? For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since we've professed our faith through covenant, we're going to do it by way of song as well. Let's stand and we'll sing our closing song, This I Believe. Lift up your hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>